And so, we arrive at the largest space marine empire in the Imperium. Once spanning 500 worlds, it covers nine systems that all swear fealty to what was the most lauded Loyalist Legion during the Hawkeye's Heresy and Great Crusade. This force was arguably as flexible as the Lunar Wolves, and were led by a Primarch who was as skilled a governor and administrator as he was warrior. The Legion was extremely hard hit during the Horus Heresy and unable to make it to Terra, but they would go on to play a fundamental role in the aftermath, including but not limited to the separation of the Legion as Astartes into the chapters we know today. They were the 13th Legion Astartes, led by the Primarch Robert Gulliman, who would become known as the Avenging Sun. They are the Ultramarines. Today, we have come to their homeworld, Macrag, a bleak yet beautiful world with uninhabitable mountains, the highest of which holds the Ultramarines Fortress Monastery, the Fortress of Hera. My name is Michael for Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to Legions, a 40k Stories mini-series. The 13th Legion Astartes were created late in the Unification Wars, and first saw combat in the pacification of Luna, though of course this action would be primarily credited to the Lunar Wolves. The initial Astartes were drawn from all over Terra, united only by the fact that they had fought against the Emperor's armies without surrender, often fighting right to the last few warriors. This left only remnant forces along with orphans and refugees to fill the ranks of the 13th, but their exceptional gene seed meant that the 13th was still a very capable legion, known for their adaptability in the field and for stability in their gene seed, created from the Primarch Robert Gilliman. The records are sadly lacking in engagements for the 13th during the initial years of the Great Crusade, though they were known to have fought in the Sol System's pacification. We know the Iron Warriors, simply the 4th Legion at the time, took Venus, the Imperial Fist secured an alliance with Uranus, and Mars was brought in by diplomacy, but any other world or moon could have been a conquest of the 13th, and there are a lot of Imperial colonies in that system, so it's likely they took at least one. The next, and last, confirmed engagement, believe me I checked, concerning the 13th was the Osiris Rebellion, centred on the world of Septus Twelve in the Osiris Cluster that the 13th had previously brought into compliance. The population was seemingly dead-eyed and very not normal, and the 13th situation only worsened as an alien race arrived both on the planet and on their ships causing many casualties, including Lord Commander Vosotho, who led them at the time. He passed command to Marius Gage, who was able to coordinate the retreat, but 6,500 Astartes died, and the mysterious Xenos had vanished when the Imperials returned. They would become known as the Osirian Cybrids, and they would cross paths with the 13th again after they were reunited with their gene father. The Great Crusade struck out to the east and found Robert Gilliman on Macrag, the 8th Primarch to be rediscovered. Robert Gilliman's gestation pod landed in the forests of Macrag, and he was taken in by Konor, one of the two governors of the world who had received a vision telling him where to go. He raised the young Primarch who, like many of his brothers, was a prodigy in all matters academic and militaristic. His name Robut, meaning Great One in the language of Macrag, which may or may not have been a form of Gothic, was backed up as he orchestrated a near-perfect campaign against the Wildmen of Illyrium in the mountainous north, also gaining their respect so that they would never be a threat again. It was around this time that the Great Crusade became aware of Gilliman, hearing great tales whilst on the planet of Espandor in what would become Ultramar, but father and son would not meet for many years due to a warp storm throwing the Imperials off course. Gilliman was, unlike some of the more psychic Primarchs, completely unaware of this, and was soon embroiled in a civil war as the other governor, Consul Gallen, had attempted a coup whilst the Primarch was away. Conor was assassinated and died not long after his son reached him, and Gilliman's forces swept aside Gallen before implementing a new system of government. Reboot was the sole consul slash ruler of Macrag from then on, and rather than a slave during aristocracy, a meritocracy based on hard work was the new way of running things. Under Robert Gilliman, Macrag flourished for around five years until the Imperium finally showed up. Like many Primarchs, Gilliman seemingly recognised the Emperor on sight, and the Lord of Mankind was very impressed with what his creation had achieved. The 13th Legion, 
who picked up the name of Ultramarine seemingly between the Osiris Rebellion and the reunion with Gilliman, were placed under the Primarch's command and relocated to Macrag, with Marius Gage passing on command to Gilliman and becoming his second. The training of recruits from Macrag was underway within a year, and the trade links formed by Gilliman with the nearby systems saw recruits drawn from them as well, forming the beginnings of the Ultramar Empire, known also as the 500 Worlds. This allowed the Ultramarines to become the largest legion of all, with around 250,000 members by the time of the Horus Heresy, and this meant that larger organisational groups in the company were required, which saw the implementation of chapters for the first time. There were 22 at the Battle of Kalth, so it seems as though each chapter was around 10,000 Astartes back then. The Ultramarines were, at least apparently, the second most successful legion during the Great Crusade, bested only by Horus Lupercal and the Lunar Wolves. Though, to be fair, Horus had a massive head start, so it's not really that fair. Countless worlds were brought into compliance by the 13th, but Gilliman was far more than simply a conqueror. Every world taken by the Ultramarines was not only subjugated, but reformed into a model imperial world, with trade routes, a government, and a solid set of defences. Given how long this must have taken, it makes Gilliman's record just that bit more impressive. We know the word bearers had a variant approach on this and were extremely slow to move on. It is unknown how many worlds were taken or how many Xenos were exterminated in order to make it happen, but one battle in particular was a great one, at least in the eyes of the old guard of the Legion, the battle at the Eurydice Terminal. Following a lead from the Warhounds, the pre-heresy name for the World Eaters, the Ultramarines were able to engage with the Osirian Cybrids once again, aiding then taking over from the 12th Legion in the battle. Gilliman, being a genius and all that, had devised a plan to take out the Xenos, who normally wore heavy exo-armour, but were only half substantial without it. Launching a bombardment and then a boarding action, the 13th fought through their foes despite heavy losses, and Gilliman eventually killed the leader of the Cybrids, who was apparently three times taller than him, and an incredible psyker that should have killed the Primarch. The only reason he didn't was Ptolemy, the first librarian of all in the Ultramarines, who shielded Gilliman, but died as a result. By the way, I know I probably mispronounced his name, I didn't really study Greek. This allows us to narrow down the date of the battle, as Ptolemy was supposedly present at the Council of Nicaea, and so the battle at the Eurydice Terminal must have been between then and the Horus Heresy. The Ultramarines campaigned a lot, as you might expect, and whilst I found records of other engagements involving them against Xenos, including Orcs and the Mind-Eating Crave, only one policing action is actually recorded, the infamous Annihilation of Monarchia, ordered by the Emperor to punish Lorgar Aurelian and the Word Bearers for their reverence of him as a god. Gilliman was actually rather uncomfortable with having to flatten the city and sour relations with the 17th, assumedly because he was so diplomatic and let's all be frenzy, but he carried out his orders as expected and put on a supporting face. This divide would be exploited by Horus and Lorgar only a few decades later, as the Horus heresy would be revealed and the Battle of Kelth took place. However, in contrast to his now poor relationship with Lorgar, Gilliman did have an inner circle of the Primarchs he was closest to and that he held the highest of his brothers, Dawn, Ferris Manus, Sanguinius and Lehman Russ, who were referred to collectively as the Dauntless Few. Convenient they'd all turn out as loyalists, eh? I'd have imagined Horus would have been in that number. The Ultramarines were perhaps the greatest logistical obstacle for Horus in the run-up to the Heresy, as their numbers and acumen both posed a major problem. As a result, the Warmaster chose instead to divert and then tie up Gwilliman and co, so he could prosecute the campaign freely. He told the Ultramarines of a major orc incursion in the Viridian system, to the galactic south and relatively close to Ultramar, and the Legion gathered at Kalth alongside a force of word-bearers to muster, but found themselves cut off due to warp interference. It was at this time that the word-bearers, led by First Captain Corferon, revealed their treachery and launched a devastating assault known now as the Battle of Kalth. For once, the genius of the Ultramarines failed the 13th, as they missed or dismissed many warnings that their allies were up to something before battle was truly joined and the first attack by their reckoning came as a captured vessel smashed into the planet and unleashed an EMP that left the Ultramarines vulnerable. Gilliman was slow and unwilling to order his sons to fight back, but once he did, the Ultramarines fought hard against their treacherous brothers. It was a tough fight, 
but eventually the Mechanicum and Ultramarines were able to push back. The word bearers had used scrap code as a weapon to shut down Kalth's weapon platforms, and in order to implement the counter code, Gwilliman launched a teleport assault on the platforms, but was lucky not to die at the hands of Corferon. He actually should have died, but the first captain instead attempted to corrupt the Primarch like a moron, and so allowed Gwilliman to strike back. With the platform then secured, the 13th finally got some form of victory, but had lost around 60% of their legionaries in the Battle of Kalth up to that point, and the planet's population were forced to retreat underground due to the now deadly radiation emitted from the system's star due to the word bearer's actions. Technically, the battle is not over, for the Mark of Kalth started at the beginning of the fight by Gwilliman will only stop with the death of every word bearer, including Lorgar. It was at this time that Gwilliman earned himself his secondary title, the Avenging Sun. The word bearers were far from done though, launching the Shadow Crusade alongside the World Eaters into the heart of Ultramar. The Ultramarines lost many worlds, including Eusaria which had in fact been within the bounds of Ultramar and never truly defeated the traitor forces. Gilliman finally caught up to Lorgar on Eusaria and the two were relatively even in their battle until Angron intervened. Gilliman was saved by some of his sons but Angron was ascended to demonhood by Lorgar on Eusaria and the 13th were forced to withdraw. The traitors also left soon after, having been able to power up the Ruin Storm and completely cut off the Ultramarines from the wider Imperium, along with the Dark Angels, Blood Angels, and members of many other legions to the Galactic East. Gilliman, concerned that Terra may have fallen without their knowledge, established Imperium Secundus based out of Macrag, but refused to lead and instead talked Sanguinius into becoming its ruler alongside Lionel Johnson. This apparently was a great concern to Malkador the Sigilite, though how he knew of it is unknown, but once the ruin storm cleared and it became apparent that Terra still stood, Imperium Secundus was dissolved and the Ultramarines made for the Sol system. This was the reason Horus was forced to rush the Battle of Terra, for he knew the Ultramarines could still tip the scales, but we would never know if this would become to pass, for the war was over by the time the 13th arrived. Why and how Sanguinius arrived in time and Gwilliman didn't is unclear but I assume it's because the Ultramarines had more forces to muster and more organisation to implement in their absence. Sanguinius and the Blood Angels could just make a run for it. In the aftermath of the Battle of Terra, the Ultramarines were the largest Loyalist Legion even after their heavy losses at Kalf. Maybe they'd had time to rebuild a little as well, and would soon come to account for half the total Loyalist Astartes or thereabouts after heavy recruiting from what remained of Ultramar. Gwilliman was thus responsible for many of the defences the Imperium was forced to undertake post-heresy, but also spent a considerable amount of time reorganising the Imperium into a state that could function without the Emperor or Malkador. It took a decade, during which time the great scouring would take place and the surviving traitors were hounded away by the Loyalists, but eventually a stable state was reached. Gwilliman had become Lord Commander of the Imperium and the Council of Terror was properly set up. With this done, Gwilliman began work on his greatest and longest lasting military endeavour, the creation of the Codex Astartes. Deciding that no one man should command the power of a legion again lest another betrayal take place, the Primarch decided to separate the legions into the chapters we know today, each 1,000 Astartes in strength, and deployed the galaxy over to defend the Imperium. This didn't go down well with Dawn, Russ, or Vulcan. Guess that trust in Dauntless View wasn't as solid as thought and the latter two never seemingly split their forces, whilst Dawn only relented after the Imperial Navy fired on the fists. Being the largest legion by a long way, the Ultramarines sired the most chapters by far, and thus many chapters today still see Gwilliman and the Ultramarines as their leech, with many Astartes trying to journey to Macrag at some point in their lives. Around this time, Gwilliman led the Ultramarines against two traitor legions. On Escrador, the Primarch Alpharius was supposedly slain by Gwilliman, Though in true Alpha Legion fashion, we don't really know whether it was Alpharius, Omegon, or simply a random Astartes elevated in some way as the 20th were known to do. In fact, the Alpha Legion was so unimpressed with the Avenging Sun that they nearly wiped out the Ultramarines on Escrador, which was only seemingly a small detachment, and won the day. The 13th also came to the aid of the Imperial Fists in the Iron Cage, saving them from probable destruction at the hands of Perturabo and the Iron Warriors. Eventually, however, Gwilliman would seemingly meet his end. We do not know when or where the death of Robert Gwilliman was, 
but it came at the hands of the demon Primarch Fulgrim, who stabbed his brother in the neck with a poisoned sword. Gilliman's body was somehow recovered and interred in a stasis field just moments before he would have truly died, and it now rests within the Temple of Correction at Macrag's North Pole, supposedly healing according to the pilgrims that come to visit it as a holy site. I'm not so sure. The Ultramarines would go on to achieve great honours for themselves and are currently led by Marnius Calgar, their chapter master and Lord Macrag. They have been bloodied by the Tyranids, but have followed the Codex Astartes almost to the letter throughout, the exception being the Tyrannic War veterans led by Chaplain Cassius that now accounts for almost half of the battered First Company. And so, with a tale of the 13th Legion told, at least while they were still a Legion, we shall explore some of the Crusade and Heresy-era heroes of the Ultramarines. Marius Gage was Terran-born, and the leader of the 13th Legion prior to the discovery of Robert Gilliman, having inherited the position following the Osiris Rebellion. When the Primarch was found and placed at the head of the Ultramarines, Gage stood aside, and would be appointed as the First Master, presumably the equivalent to First Captain, as he was the leader of the First Chapter, and so the highest ranking Astartes in the Legion, which makes sense given he once led it. Gage's actions during the Crusade are sadly poorly documented, as we don't know of any engagement he was known to have fought in, though I would suspect that the first chapter will have seen a lot of action due to its standing, its leader, and the sheer amount of wars the Ultramarines fought in. I would almost guarantee he was present for the battle at the Eurydice Terminal, given that he'd fought against the Assyrian Cybrids before, and wanted to remove the stain on the Legion's honour caused by the Osiris Rebellion. Plus he probably had some good intel. He finally popped up again at Kalth, unsurprisingly, and was on board Gwilliman's flagship, the Macrag's Honour, when the word bearers revealed their treachery. It was Gage who repeatedly urged the Primarch to allow the Ultramarines to fight back, eventually receiving the order and beginning the mark of Kalth that ticks on to this day. He was eventually to be transferred to another vessel to try and stop the orbital bombardment, but would never get chance as Lorgar made contact with Gilliman. This caused a demonic incursion on the bridge of the Macrag's honour, and Gage lost one of his hands and only survived because he was saved by Aeneid Thiel, who we'll be talking about a little later. Gage took back the auxiliary bridge and was able to communicate with the forces on the ground, then organised a repulsion action against the word-bearer borders until he was finally reunited with Gilliman. The Primarch elected to lead the team attacking the defence platform personally, and gave Gage a real death stare when the First Master tried to suggest otherwise. Given Gilliman should have died, Gage probably had a point. He was then ordered to pursue Corferon and the Macrag's honour rather than rendezvousing with Gilliman after the platform was taken, and succeeded in chasing down and destroying the Infidus Imperator, the flagship of the first captain who escaped using as a thame to the demon world Sicarus. However, the Ultramarine's vessel was heavily damaged in the engagement that took place deep within the warp, and has yet to be heard from again. Gage ordered field repairs to be undertaken, promising that they would one day get home to Macrag and Ultramar, but we are still waiting to see if the First Master and his Primarch's flagship will show up again. Given the weird time flow of the warp, it's not impossible that Marius Gage could still be alive, but I find it highly improbable. Whilst the First Master fought his battles amongst the Ultramarine's fleet, one of his captains was leading the defence of Kalth on the ground. Remus Ventanus was the fourth captain of the first chapter and was at the Numinous spaceport when the hijacked vessel crashed. Ventanus and his allies discovered the treachery when they saw a dead honour guard who had simply been standing around when all hell broke loose, and the captain took their standard with him, presumably because a standard represents that company or chapter's honour, and letting it fall would tarnish that. Eventually meeting with loyal Skitari and Mechanicum forces, it was Ventanus who made contact with the Macrag's honour and Marius Gage, briefing him and getting himself informed. He then killed the supposedly surrendering force captain of the word bearer's Morpal Seer, C-X, don't really know how to pronounce it, but this was what the traitor had planned, as it allowed the demon Samus to possess him, knocking out the Ultramarines. Don't know why he didn't kill them, honestly, it's a bit weird. When he awoke, Ventanus used a captured Athame dagger to defeat Samus, who had killed a Shadow Sword super heavy tank, amongst other things, during his rampage, before learning of the kill code that would destroy the scrap code keeping the Loyalists from accessing the weapons grid, which had been created by the predecessor to the Magos he was with. Said predecessor had died during the battle, not long after creating the kill code. Fighting to secure control of the data engine just long enough for Gwilliman to defeat Corferon, Ventanus and all others not evacuated from Kalth were forced underground by the now lethal radiation spewing for the Viridia Star. 
The battles that followed, known as the Underground War, saw the fourth captain earn yet more honour and glory for himself, leading the defence of the caverns and ultimately coming out victorious. However, he did accidentally create the demon prince Emkar when he killed the dark apostle Malok Kartha with the athame known as the Shard of Erebus, which would be used to finally kill the demon by Manius Kalgar in Vengeance for Kalf. So yeah, this guy killed two word bearer commanders and created one demon prince and had one of them possessed. Something about demons in this guy, ain't there? Ventanus did survive the heresy and led the exterminators of Colchis, the word bearer's former homeworld, planting the standard he had recovered on Kalf as a way of showing that this was vengeance for that planet. He would eventually die, though when and where is unknown, and be buried on Kalf where he would lie in peace until Amkar and the warsmith Honsu of the Iron Warriors invaded Ultramar. Uriel Ventris, fourth captain of the Ultramarines chapter, coincidental, maybe? Mm. Had found Ventanus' tomb as a youth, and would fight against the Iron Warrior within it. The former fourth captain's remains were destroyed, but his spirit would rise again alongside the Legion of the Damned, saving his successor and giving him the Shard of Erebus that would go on to kill Amkar. So if you didn't believe in ghosts in the 41st millennium, well... There's some pretty unequivocal evidence for you. After the decree at Nicaea, every legion's librarius was disbanded and its members returned to the rank and file. One of those among the ultramarines was Tylos Rubio, a codicia before Nicaea who joined back with the 21st company and suppressed its powers. His chapter is sadly unknown as 20 of the 22 were present on Kalt so we can't really narrow it down. He was planet side when the word bearers attacked their former brothers but like many of the former librarians, he had been forewarned. In the run-up to the betrayal, many of the psychers in the 13th experienced headaches brought on by the incoming word-bearer rituals. The cultists began 60 hours before Gwilliman gave the order to fight back at a time known as Mark Zero. But they did not speak of it to anyone and attributed it to fatigue. Rubio would regret his inaction for the rest of his days. You know, hindsight is twenty twenty and all that. When it all went south... The 21st Company were nearly wiped out, with only a few escaping the initial attack before taking up position in a railway tunnel heading to Kalt's capital, Numinous. They lost their captain, whose name is unknown, but before the next traitor force engaged them, Nathaniel Garrow arrived. The former Death Guard had been sent by Malkador the Sigilite to recruit Rubio into what would become the Knight's Errant, a title coined by Rubio during this meeting and then adopted by Garrow. But the Ultramarine refused to abandon his brothers. To his surprise, Garrow chose to stand and fight alongside the Ultramarines, helping the 21st Company defend against the word bearers until they were pushed back by Terminators. Rubio had had many chances to reactivate his psychic abilities and save his brothers, but did his best not to in order to honour the decree of Nicaea. Eventually, though, he unleashed them, collapsing the tunnel and saving everyone. Unfortunately, his brothers didn't take too kindly to that, and he was shunned by them, which is ironic given that Gwilliman would reinstate the Librarius not soon after Kalf. With no choice left, Rubio joined Garrow, becoming the first of the Knights Errant beside the Death Guard. He would be part of the team to recruit Garviel Locon on Istvan III, and on the mission to the Vengeful Spirit, where he was badly wounded by the demon Tormageddon. But his only known solo mission was one to Baal, home of the Blood Angels Legion. With Sanguinius and a large portion of the Legion believed lost on Sickness Prime, Rubio had been sent by Malkador to order the Angel's sons to disband and join up with the other Legions. The former Ultramarine was lucky to survive, as the Blood Angels left on Baal were, unsurprisingly, not pleased. I know they say don't shoot the messenger, but the author of said message was all the way back on Terra, so... yeah. Rubio was only saved due to a message coming through from the Sickness system that the Primarch and his sons yet lived. We'll be talking about Sickness Prime more when we get to discuss the Blood Angels, so I'll leave that there for now. Rubio's eventual fate, like many of the Knights Errant, is slightly a mystery. Given his psychic abilities, it is almost certain that he was one of the original eight Grand Masters of the Grey Knights, and it is my hope that we can pen down all of them by the end of this series. Furthermore, at the close of the Pandorax campaign in M41, Abaddon captured Epimetheus, another founding Grand Master, and was debating his identity. He ruled out several individuals, including Rubio, which may imply that the despoiler crossed paths with the former Ultramarine sometime after the Horus Heresy, and potentially even killed him. Perhaps of all the regular Astartes we've explored, 
it was Aeneid Thiel who would have the longest lasting effect on the chapter. Thiel was a sergeant in the 13th chapter's 135th company, but we do not have his combat record prior to Calf, just like everyone else I could find, unfortunately. His first noteworthy action was a thought experiment on Astartes fighting other Astartes, which saw him censured by the Legion. The Ultramarines always created these theoreticals for their enemies, so as they would be better prepared to face them, but no one had even considered the idea of doing it for other Space Marines, at least not publicly, until Thiel. The sergeant was adamant that it was a worthy endeavour to at least consider the idea, but his superiors were having none of it, and at the time of Cal Thiel was aboard the McCrag's honour to supposedly be censured by Gwilliman himself. He wore a red-marked helmet, marking him out as censured or awaiting it, but when the incursion began on the flagship he was quick to act, saving the life of First Master Gage as we mentioned before. Thiel's formerly traitorous thinking was accepted by Gilliman, and the sergeant helped scour the ship before joining his Primarch in the battle with Corferon. Before that, however, Gilliman ordered all sergeants to mark their helms with red, just as Thiel had been forced to do, to give a clear visual indicator of who was in command, due to the disrupted and fragmented communications. This would become a tradition in the Ultramarines after the word bearers were driven off, and the red helmets are still used to denote sergeants today in many Codex chapters, becoming a badge of honour as opposed to shame. Theo returned to Kalth after the battle with Corferon to lead a relief effort, but what became of him is sadly unknown. Gilliman was nearly assassinated by an Alpha Legion team posing as Theo and his squad on Macrag, and the Ultramarines were unable to find any trace of the sergeant on Kalth. This means that Theo may have died on Kalth and his body had been lost. He may have been assassinated by the Alpha Legion en route to Macrag and lost in space. Or perhaps he was in fact an agent of Alpharius all along. But I doubt it. And so we come to the close of the Ultramarines Legion's tale. The 13th Legion were incredibly efficient and effective in the Great Crusade, both as conquerors and empire builders, and they have continued to be a powerful and noteworthy force for the last 10,000 years. They may have been without Gwilliman for a long time, and it is unknown how he would view their total adherence to his codex, but I would wager that the Avenging Sun would still be pretty proud of his chapter were he to awaken. And now, we must depart from Macrag and from Ultramar entirely, re-entering the webway. The next Legion world is a fair old jump away, and I'll use that time to discuss some more things about the Orcs, since I said that I wanted to revisit them at some point. I hope you can join me as we explore the Freebooters, Dread Mobs, and the Cult of Speed. Thank you all for watching, my name is Michael for Tatsuka Imperialis, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.